During the final couple of laps, I very clearly said to my partner, James, that if I ever thought about doing this again, he should probably throw my laptop away and cut up my credit card. Um, Mm. And within about a week, I wanted to do another. Um, (laughs) I think the memory of all of the pain and all of the heat was gone and I just wanted to do another. That's age grouper and intensive care doctor and anaesthetist Sarah Marsden talking about her first Ironman at the Lakesman. And this is Age Group Stories brought to you by the Oxygen Addict Triathlon Podcast. Hello and welcome to the Oxygen Addict Triathlon Podcast. We're brought to you every week by our sponsors, precisionhydration.com. Electrolytes in different strengths that match how you sweat. You can get 15% off your first order with the code OxygenAddict15. And we're also brought to you by Peloton.cc, high performance sun protection for athletes. You can get 20% off with the code OxygenAddict20. Hello and welcome to the show, everyone. This week's interview is with age group story, Sarah Marsden. Sarah is an athlete we coach in Team Oxygen Addict. She is an incredibly busy ICU doctor working on an awful lot of the sort of COVID wards at the moment. And she's also mixing and matching all of those crazy shifts that she has to do really long and really like summer nights and summer days and then some days off matches all that with training for triathlon and training for challenge Roth for next year. So I thought it'd be really interesting to get her in and firstly hear about how she manages to balance her training with her work life and some tips around that. And also hear some of the stories from somebody working on the very front lines at the moment. So I really hope you enjoy that story later on. But first we have news and results from the world of triathlon. And the great news is there's been some racing started again this week. First up, though, shout out to our new sponsors, Peloton.cc. Now, if you've been down to one of the Outlaw events, you will be no stranger to Peloton. They are a cracking triathlon and cycling specific sun cream manufacturer. Um, They produce high performance sun protection designed specifically to improve performance for triathletes and cyclists in hot weather conditions. Their official sun protection supplier to British Cycling, the Great Britain Cycling Team, British Triathlon. They um, give sun cream to EF Education First Cycling Team. And they're also trusted by Olympic gold medalists and Ironman world champions in the triathlon field. So you can you can have a few good guesses as to who that might be. Um, I really like this company. I love Tom, the guy behind it. We spent a lot of time together hanging out at the Outlaw events while people were racing. We really, really got on well together. And I've been hoping to work with him for some time. I think they've got a cracking product. And obviously, we're here in the middle of August. It's a great time perfect time for you to be buying sun cream if you're going away on your holidays and going away training so it's great to get to work with them so here's the key fact right it's really haven't talked about this before on the show it's something that's really close to my heart a couple of years ago i had a horrible thing grow on my arm is the only way to describe it halfway down my bicep i had something grow that looked like a boil at first and it grew and grew over a few days at a scary rate and it ended up being something called a keratoacanthoma which luckily for me is just this side of being classed as skin cancer um it grew in 14 days it grew from being something that just looked like a little spot to being something the size of a blueberry so i watched this thing grow day by day um it was hideous it, it literally looked like a blueberry on my skin by the end of it and it's caused by sun damage so i ended up having to go into the skin hospital and having it removed a long story short it's caused by years of sun damage and not having adequate sun protection when i was in my sort of late teens and early 20s and working out on beaches so ever since then i mean to be perfectly honest even in the years before that as a grown adult i've been much better about putting sun cream on but that really brought home to me it's one of those if you could go back in time in a delorean moment go back to your 18 or 19 year old self and say do you know what mate the one thing you could really do now is not get sunburned every other day on the beach be a really good thing to take care of so it's been something that's close to my heart because of that and obviously tom having met him at the events at the outlaw 
he gave me some sample packs for this to try. And I think it's just a fantastic product. They've got two things for cyclists. They've got a, a clear spray and they've also got like a little roll on pack that goes in your back pocket as you're actually out riding. So you've got the clear spray to put on before you go riding or before you go training. And you've got a little roll on pack to take out with you. So you can actually apply it. It's really clever because it's a roll on. You can actually apply it as you're riding. Um, so it's really super useful. And the thing that he's really come up with here is he's gone out to design a sun cream that's specific to athletes, cyclists and triathletes. So my experience has been if you get your bog standard sun cream from any of the supermarkets, it's great when you're on the beach, but it's kind of heavy and gloopy and it, I feel like it stops me sweating. And Tom's kind of said that that's exactly the problem with it. He's had this product designed to be sweat and water resistant. So um, it binds to the skin around your pores, but it doesn't block your pores. So you can still sweat freely, but the product won't be washed away by sweating, which is the absolute key to having sun cream on that's going to protect you all day if you're out for really, really long rides. So um, I'm a really big fan of this. SPF 30, all day protection. So if you've been out for adventures recently and you're going out for adventures in the sunshine coming up, I think you owe it to yourself to have some really top quality sun cream. Uh, go and check it out over at peloton.cc. And remember, you can get 20% off with the code OxygenAddict20. Like I said, I love this stuff. I swear by it. I've worn it on two of the adventures I'm going to tell you about coming up later in the show. And it's done me proud going out and training and racing. Well, not racing exactly, but getting beasted by my face <laughs> as close as I'm going to get to racing soon. And it stayed on all day. And for a like ginger haired guy like me to not get sunburned when I'm out in the sun is a big deal. So I'm a massive fan of it. Go over and check it out over at peloton.cc. So adventures I've been having his is the first big adventure I've had recently um me and a few of my pals went out and rode the Fred Witten route we managed to get our calendars together and we had one day when it was potential that all of us could get together and do it and we said we're only going to go and do this if the weather looks like it's not going to rain because it's pretty brutal for those of you who don't know Fred Witten is 112 mile cycle route that goes around the Lake District and takes in all of the major climbs it takes in six of the big mountain passes and God only knows how many other climbs in there as well that aren't even classified. Um, it goes over Kirkstone Pass. It goes over, let's see if I can get these right in order. It goes over, um, uh, what's that first one called with the slate mine at the top of it? Damn it. All right, here we go. It's uh, Kirkstone Pass, then Honister, then Newlands, then Winlatter, then the horrible drag up Cold Fell. Then the ridiculously steep hard knot and rhinos passes at the end um, when you're absolutely beasted. I think we've been out for about eight hours of you know, not constant riding time, but eight hours on the clock by the time we got to the base of hard knot. Hard knot's got a 33% section in it, and it's it's quite ridiculous. But we had an absolutely brilliant day out. Like I said before, use the old uh, Peloton sun cream to keep us covered up all day. And we needed it in places as well. It came out nice and bright and sunny for a while. So that was really good. Had an absolutely epic day out. And I want to use this opportunity to encourage you to get out there and, and do an adventure like this. There might not be many organized events on at the moment, but there's nothing stopping you from downloading a GPS route into your Garmin and going out and riding the thing yourself. We stopped at the top of... Uh, of Winlatter had a sandwich there we stopped at a little shop somewhere just before hard knot pass and filled up on candle mint cake and coca-cola and refilled our water bottles it was just a brilliant day out I can honestly say it was one of the best days out I've had um, and the three that I was riding with agree as well and say it was just a fantastic adventure so we basically left the left the car park at 8 a.m and got back just before 7 p.m having had some you know nice relaxing breaks along the way as well so get out there and give yourself an adventure along the way it's really been a fantastic cap to my summer um i'm going to talk a little bit about max six later on other adventures we've been having racing has come back to the uk so the cotswold 113 event it's been the first event i've been aware of that's happened over under the new british triathlon covid rules a couple of our team members took part in it we had our team call this week and chatted to them about it and they said hats off to the organizers it was absolutely brilliant it was it was run in a really safe feeling manner there were about 300 people took took part in it i think in the end and a clever thing they did in transition was they had a, a kind of 
un, untimed transition where everybody had 10 minutes to get through. And they had this to, to keep social distancing working. They said, right, when you get to near your bike, if you can see that there's a person either side of your bike, you just stand back and wait until one of them goes to allow you to be two meters from the other people at all times. Um, they said they had hand sanitizer on the aid stations on the run. So you squirted hand sanitizer on yourself before you got to the, the drinks and snacks and stuff. So it sounds like it was really well run. And like I said, the two guys we had, Alex and Bayo, who took part, said it was just fantastic event to just get out and do an event again. So there's hope here that we're going to have more events happening this summer. I know um, Outlaw X has got a huge ton of space there and the organizers are talking about really spreading out the racking and transitions there uh, to allow racing to go ahead. So I'm really hopeful that all things being equal and, you know, the, the R rate staying as it is, that's likely to go ahead, hopefully. Um, so, yeah, fingers crossed. Sounds like that was a cracking event. So Cotswold 113 organizers, hats off to you. Well done for putting on a great event that it's certainly athletes I coach have given really positive feedback about. Now, how about this for an adventure? Nick Pocock, who you'll have heard on last week's episode in our age group story, Nick sent this through on our Facebook group. Um, friends of his, their teenage son, who's 16, his name's Nathan, and two of his mates heard about the idea of Everesting on the bike. They heard about the idea 10 days ago, and by Friday, they decided they were going to give it a go on mountain bikes. 16 years old, they went out and they rode 187 miles with 29,081 feet of climbing. It took them 22 hours to go up and down a local road close to them out in uh, somewhere out in Minnesota. That is an absolutely epic, epic effort by these guys. So Nathan, I don't know your surname, but hats off to you and your friends. You're getting my Badass of the Week award. I think that's absolutely fantastic. I'm going to get Nick to find out where you are and what your address is. I want to send you some Team OA hats for you and your pals. I think that's absolutely brilliant. And do you know, Everest has been one, Everesting has been one of those things I've looked at and gone, ah, oh, do you know, that's just too epic. It'll take too long. But I'm inspired to go and give that a go. If these kids can do it in 22 hours on mountain bikes, there's really no excuses. And apparently they did it all in one go as well. It was a proper 22 hour effort, um, start to finish, you know, had some breaks in there, but it was all in one sitting. So hats off to you guys. Right. Other bits and bobs I've seen around out there. The new specialized Tarmac SL7 is out. I've had first-hand view of this via performance chef Alan Murchison's Instagram account. He's been out hammering the SL7 around, and you've got to go and check his Instagram account. He's he's ridden the timed section on the new Tarmac SL7 on his Venge and on his Shiv. And the Tarmac SL7 came out faster than the Venge, but only a handful of seconds slower over like a 13-minute segment than his Shiv, which is just ridiculous given that, you know, you fully aero down on the on the aero bars on the Shiv. So it looks like, you know, Specialized have smashed this out of the park. It's a beautiful looking bike. It's apparently, you know, as light as the tarmac and as aero as the venge so it looks like they've moved the goalposts again really impressed by it so get over to alan's instagram account and check that out it looks like a pretty uh, pretty amazing bike and fair play to al for giving it a good beasting and i also want to give a shout out to my my now good friend matt bottrell who i've got to know through the bike fits he's been doing for our athletes and for the various bits and bobs he's done on the podcast for us he's been sending some bike fit photos through this week he must have done five bike fits on our athletes this week some virtual and some in person and the positions he's getting our athletes into are just amazing photos are coming back with athletes looking so fast and aerodynamic and everybody's got good things to say about it so if you're looking for a bike fit and you've got some spare time at the moment i believe matt is doing in-person bike fits again both his silver and gold level so you can check him out through his website you just google matt bottrell bike fitting and, and you'll come up with that but matt's been doing a great job and i've been really impressed it's really getting me fired up again to uh to get on the bike and get out and go around and go and go fast again other things we've seen super league triathlon have just sent out an update on their arena games that are taking place on august the 23rd 
Um, now then, let's see if we can get this right. What's the latest on the arena games here? Confirmed athletes that we've got taking place. We've got on the men's side, Javier Gomez, Johnny Brownlee, Richard Murray, Jonas Scumberg, Pierre Lacour, Anthony Piades, Justus, uh, I can't pronounce that, Niels Lag, the German champion who came racing out of nowhere, amongst others. And over on the ladies' side, we've got Cassandra Bogrand, who had that heartbreaking mechanical at Super League Malta. Anne Haug has been confirmed to race there as well, reigning Ironman world champion. Rachel Klamer, who we had on the show a couple of weeks back. Georgia Taylor-Brown, Jess Learmont, Leonie Periol, Ilaria Zane. They've got some massive names racing out for this. So it's going to be pool swim and then swift racing on the bike and i believe swift racing on the treadmill as well on the run it's going to be 23rd of august so watch this watch this space for that if you are in the i guess you'd call it in the local area of the super league uh, arena games and that means basically being able to get yourself to Rotterdam to see it in person. They've got a competition at the moment to win two tickets to the SLT Arena Games. Um, You just need to go to the Super League Try website and go and register to try and win a couple of free tickets. So think carefully about how you do the travel stuff. Um, But if you can get there, and especially if you're, you know, local to Rotterdam, it's a no-brainer, isn't it, to go and be able to watch this taking place. So, yeah, good stuff. It feels like exciting, exciting things are happening again. Also, something I wanted to flag up here, there's a great interview with with uh, the PTO, the Pro Triathletes Organization. Their chairman, Charles Adamo, was interviewed on slowtwitch.com. It's a really great interview with him, and he's put some numbers to this, which I never previously realized. He's basically sort of saying, you know, we're, we're saying $2 million, $2.5 million that they've put into triathlon this year. It seems like a huge amount of money to us, but really it's a drop in the ocean compared to what they're planning to do. And I wanted to highlight this quote because it really sort of raised this in my mind. He said that the UFC, the Ultimate Fighting Championship, that's one of the things they're using as a model. And he said that they they eventually yeah, they lost forty million dollars, the UFC, before they turned it around and eventually became a company that was sold for two billion dollars. They did this by promoting the fighters. They stopped promoting it as an event and they started promoting the individual personalities. And so he said, the reason that you know who Conor McGregor is, they put huge amounts of money and effort and airtime behind promoting Conor McGregor. And and as the public got to know the personalities, that's what grew the sport and that's what allowed them to sell ultimately the UFC for $2 billion. That's what they're planning to do in triathlon. That's the kind of model they're looking at. And Charles has sat down with the um, the previous team behind the UFC to see how they went about it. That's the kind of money they're talking about. They're not looking at it in terms of two or three or five or 10 million. They're talking about going into the billion dollar revenue in terms of triathlon. And their plan is to promote individual triathletes and promote the head-to-head races in a way that's going to grab the public's attention. And it made me think if you can do it with, you know, what was eventually, uh, what was ultimately, if you think back to cage fighting before the UFC, knee sport doesn't even begin to describe it. And it's become as big as boxing. They can market triathlon correctly and put the same kind of effort behind it. And they can do the same stuff for our triathlon names as, as was done in the UFC. That's a massive, massive opportunity. So I'm really excited to see what they can do. And I thought that was really worth flagging up. Get over and read that interview over on Slow Twitch because I think the PTO have clearly got a massive vision and you know we can get behind that and start to think, yeah, there's no reason our sport can't be as big as UFC, certainly. All right, I'm going to talk about Coach's Couch this week. We're going to talk about our Max 6 event that our Team Oxygen Athletes did over this past weekend. So I've talked about it a little bit before. The Max 6 event was the idea of trying to get our athletes to swim for an hour, ride for three hours, and run for two hours. A personal challenge event done individually, but knowing that your other teammates are out there doing it as well over a weekend. And the idea was to push yourself as hard as you can, go as far as you can in an hour on the swim, three hours on the bike and two hours on the run. And we had a pretty amazing turnout. We had over 60 of our athletes have a crack at this over the weekend. Um, We built people up to this with a training plan that I built for over the the previous 12 weeks. Um, And 
it really was a chance for athletes to, you know, in the absence of real racing, to really give themselves a chance to push as hard as they wanted to and see what they could do. There were no limits on whether you did the ride outdoors or indoors. So some people did it on Swift and some people did it outdoors. You could do the run on the treadmill or outdoors. Obviously the swim, most people did this in an outdoor um, an outdoor swim venue and measured it with the Garmin. But how about this for some of the performances that were put out there by our athletes? Craig won the Max 6 Punisher Award for choosing the hilliest bike and run routes he could find. He did over 2,000 meters of climbing during his three-hour ride and 900 meters of ascent by running up and down Scarfell Pike. Natalie won the Best Female Performance Award for completing her longest ever continuous swim, furthest ever run, and longest ever TT ride. Simon got the Best Male Performance Award for covering 3,900 metres on the swim, 115k on the bike, and 26k on the run. Laura won what we called the, the Max 6 Digging Deep Award, who she got food poisoning and endured a, fast, a fasted Zwift ride for three hours and a real battle to get the two-hour run done. So well done, Lara. David got the Race Execution Award for a perfectly paced swim, bike, and run with PBs all round, nailed the nutrition and the hydration perfectly. Gareth won what we're calling our Inspiration Award. Gareth came back from a near-fatal accident in the Alaskan wilderness earlier this year. I'm hoping to have him on the podcast so you can hear about it. He was out on a, um, a skidoo expedition and a hideous storm came in. They got completely snowbound. Uh, him and his team all got frostbite and we thought, I mean, luckily he didn't do, but it looked like he might lose toes or even lose his feet as part of the recovery from this. So it's been a massive path back for Gareth to come back and manage to actually even be able to get back to the point he could walk and then run again. So to have him complete the max six and nail nearly 21K in two hours was just fantastic. So I'm really proud of him for doing that. And uh, he put some pretty brutal pictures up in the Facebook group of his events as well. So like I said, I'm hoping to get him on the show to tell the full story of that because it's pretty amazing. We had literally dozens of other people swimming and running the furthest they'd ever done and setting PBs in the half marathon, record times over the bike distances. So it's something that we we hatched as a plan and really managed to get people inspired and pushing themselves. So I just wanted to say well done to everybody who took part in it. Um, it was pretty full on weekend and uh, it inspired me to get out there as well. I managed to get out and ride over three hours and I didn't quite cover two hours on the run. I managed an hour 45 on the run, but really good to get out there and do more than I really was planning on doing at the weekend. Then it was all inspired by other members of the team. So hats off to everyone who took part in that really impressive stuff. Um, if you want to find out more, you can book a call with me and the team about Team Oxygen Addict Coaching. It's a link in the show notes for that. And you can ride and train with us on Swift on Tuesdays, 7.15 p.m. UK time on the Oxygen Addict Triathlon Podcast Power Hour. Workouts guaranteed to raise your FTP and give you a faster, more powerful bike leg this coming season. This week's interview of the week is sponsored by Precision Hydration. Get over to their website and take their online sweat test and they'll give you a really good lead as to whether you're a particularly salty or particularly heavy sweater. And if you are, you certainly need a hydration strategy. And that means taking care of the amount of electrolytes that you lose in your sweat. Hydration doesn't just mean replacing water. It means replacing the correct concentration of electrolytes that you lose in your sweat. So for me, I need those 1500 milligram Precision Hydration sachets. I started with pH 1500 in each bottle and I took four extra out with me as well so I could top them up along the way with a water bottle. So it really kept me going and I was super glad not to get any cramp as I was trying to wind my way up hard not pass at the end of the day. So they're absolutely perfect for keeping you well hydrated and keeping your electrolyte levels correct. So prevent cramp keep yourself hydrated it's a no-brainer you can use the code oxygenatic 15 for 15 percent off your first order over at precisionhydration.com okay here we go over to this week's interview of the week with sarah marsden right sarah welcome to the podcast it's uh, lovely to have an opportunity to chat with you how are you doing today Oh, not bad, thank you. Not bad. Sun shining. I'm not at work, so it's all good. It is. We're recording. Um, it'll go out in a couple of weeks, this, but it's the baking hot day that people will remember from a couple of weeks ago. It's, I'm sitting here in the office and it must be about 30 degrees here and I've got the window closed because Ruby the dog is there on the prowl. She's about to start woofing, I think, as we speak at people who dare to walk past. Come here, Ruby. Come on. Leave him alone. There you go. Um, 
Yeah, so Baking Heart, but it's nice to get a chance to chat with you. So tell us a little bit about yourself and your background and how you get into triathlon. The first thing to set up here is you are a sort of competitive age grouper, but also junior doctor working in ICU as an anaesthetist. So in terms of like crazy work schedules, weird shifts, like mental how do you fit the training in type stuff, I thought you'd be a good person to talk to because I think often people sit there and think, well, I could never do X, Y, or Z because I've got all these other things going on. So it's great to get a chance to talk to somebody who has got a lot of stuff going on and maybe learn a little bit how you do fit it in. So kick off with what does what does the average week in the life of someone in your job position look like? Yeah, so nice to be on the podcast. Um, I am a junior doctor working in anaesthetics and intensive care. I work in quite a small hospital at the moment in Yorkshire, but I rotate year on year between bigger and smaller hospitals to get the training experience. Um, My job is very varied. Anaesthetics is a really varied job. So it can be anaesthetizing small children one day for dental operations right up to elderly patients. Uh, We do work in maternity around pain relief, cesarean sections, that kind of thing. And our other main sort of area of work is intensive care. Uh, So stabilising the very sickest patients that come to hospital uh, and looking after them whilst they're there. ICU is mainly staffed by anaesthetic doctors. Um, okay, and with right. being a junior doctor, the shift pattern is absolutely all over the place. Um, it's a mixture of our short day shifts, which are 10 hours long, uh, eight till six, and our long day shifts and night shifts, which are both 12 and a half hours long. And they're all resident in the hospital. Wow. So a short day is 10 hours and a long day is 12 and a half. And how often do you like how often do you do one of each kind of thing? Um, usually in normal times, um, it's an eight week kind of rolling rotor. And within that there'll be, um, seven night shifts, usually split into fours and threes and seven long day shifts kind of scattered amongst it. Uh, the pandemic we found ourselves in did shake that up a little bit. So at one point since March, all of my shifts have been 12 and a half hours long and the rotor has varied between three days on three days off or three nights on three days off. Um, to the pattern at the moment which is sort of one in two weekends so it's a little bit slacker but not much at the moment so next week we go back to a a more normal rotor thank goodness so basically you you're in there for the business end of 12 hours if not actually 12 hours every day so it's like 6 a.m to 6 p.m or 8 a.m to 8 p.m how do you go about fitting in sort of fitting in your training around that and in fact before we do that bit let's talk a little bit about the races that you've done and the events that you've done so in terms of backgrounds in middle and long distance racing what have you completed so far um so i started triathlon in 2014 2015 as i came to the end of medical school um and i completed my first 70.3 the following year in 2016 Um, Really enjoyed it and decided to jump in with both feet and do my first full distance in 2017, which I did at the Lakesman Triathlon. Nice. Um, I don't particularly like hot weather for racing, so I picked the Lake District and was rewarded with that weird 32 degree Father's Day. Oh, was that the the really, really hot one? The really hot year, yeah. yeah. So that was an interesting experience. That it was, yeah. (laughs) Um, And then since then, I've done a few more 70.3s along the way. Um, had plans in 2019 to return to full distance because I felt like I had a bit of unfinished business, um, but was foiled that time by a bout of appendicitis. And then obviously this year, my deferred place got bounced again because of coronavirus. <laughs> so I'm hoping 2021 is my grand iron distance comeback. Uh, it didn't quite go to plan this year then, hey? Not quite. No. Wow. All right. So we're, we're looking at training for either middle or long distance triathlon here and fitting it in around 10 to 12 hour days. So how would, not that there will be like a standard week, but how would you go about fitting your training in before or after work? Um, The first thing to say is that you have to be flexible. I can't really do what a lot of people do and say Tuesday is my bike plus run day. It has to be quite flexible. Um, Conflict of interest. I am a team OA athlete. um, (laughs) There's no conflict. (laughs) (laughs) They're the only people I can get to interview at the moment. (laughs) Our training plans are very much written to empower us to be able to move our training around in a way that feels appropriate to us and that will get the most out of it for us. 
Um, and we're given guidance each week as to how to move sessions around, which obviously I have to do quite a bit. Yeah, of course. Um, the average week sort of prior to COVID, obviously still featuring swimming, um, was usually a couple of turbo sessions during the week um, in a more normal week, uh, which would normally be after work in an evening. And a long ride, usually outdoors at the weekend, weather permitting. Uh, and then a couple of shorter runs in the week and a longer run at the weekend. Um, running, I find a bit easier to fit in in the morning before work. Um, so if needed, I sometimes run between 5.15 and 5.30 in the morning. Um, really? Because proper... I have to be... Yeah, really early because I have to be at work uh, in scrubs ready to go at 8 a.m. Um, to go and see the either the patient's having operations that day have to be met by the anaesthetist before surgery or I have to be in intensive care handover by 8 a.m. So either very early morning runs because I've found over the years I've been a doctor so far I've found despite my best intentions if I plan to run after work when I get home at nine o'clock it just doesn't happen. No. Um, I think my sofa has a magnetic force field to be honest and if my bum <laughs> touches that sofa at the end of the shift it's game over. So I found even though it feels awful getting up at pre-work really early uh, usually just an easy run I can fit that in without too much stress and uh, just have breakfast afterwards and then go straight to work. Um, swimming at the moment's been pretty non-existent <laughs> but usually swimming is something that I fit in either at the weekend or on the days when I've swum early in the morning when I'm on a normal day shift, I can fit it in after work. Um, or if I've got days off, because around my weird night shifts and things, we get our rest days and things. So generally, I just sit down on a Sunday night, look at the training sessions I've got to go in the following week and kind of fit in what I can. I try and fit in the longer, harder sessions or the key sessions on the off days or the normal days at work. And then... After that, I kind of slot in the nice to have sessions, the the extra easy runs, um, the less important sessions, just so that if if things fall by the wayside, which they sometimes do, the least important sessions get canned. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, how do you go about managing your fatigue on a day to day basis? Because I'd imagine there's a a huge element of the like whatever happens at work in a in a standard day must be magnified 10 times for someone working in ICU is it is it a, a big are you affected by like what's happened at work and is that a big challenge in trying to fit the training in uh, it can be because obviously with our skills in anesthetics we get involved with the very sickest patients in the hospital yeah. and sometimes it can be quite emotionally yeah yeah difficult and quite stressful um and quite often we end up whether we want to or not, in the leadership role with sick patients, because we're the people with the skills, people often breathe a bit of a sigh of relief when we turn up and hand over control to us. Um, so that's part of the reason why I find running straight after getting home from one of the longer shifts where I'm covering emergencies quite tough, because I think sometimes the emotional stress of the day makes it a bit harder to want to get out in the evening. So that's part of the reason why I tend to run before the on-call shifts that can be a bit more challenging. Um, and then other than that, I find I have to have a bit of a conversation with myself sometimes about <laughs> is this emotional fatigue and stress or is this genuinely my body being physically tired? Um, the other thing that's been really useful over the past two or three months has been st starting to use the HRV for training app, which has been on the podcast, um, because I think sometimes when you're a very go getting person that's used to being busy, you don't have the best handle on how tired you actually are and sometimes having those numbers just to guide alongside what you think can be really helpful yeah that was going to be my next question actually as to um i was having the nose at your training peaks as we as we spoke oh no there's so much red at the moment <laughs> <laughs> i love that that's your first go-to you're a super busy icu doctor when you go and there's loads of red there's loads of green as well sarah <laughs> Yeah. So let's give you the pat on the back for that. That my question was going to be sort of around the HRV guidance. Is that something that you found really useful in terms of cuz I I absolutely get what you say. Sometimes you just have to have a mindset and I'm sure to do your job it must be 10 times this. The sort of I'm going to get it done anyway and you'll develop certain mental tricks to just kind of let your mind bully your body into doing things almost at times. What effects have you found that the, the HRV for training app has had since you started using it? Um, I think there's been a few days. It's been a bit split, really. There's been a few days where I've thought I'm really, really tired. 
and then I've checked my HRV and it's actually been quite well recovered said I'm ready to go so I thought well I'll give the plan session a whirl and actually found I'm I'm great when I get going yeah um and it was probably just that I'm mentally a bit overloaded or something and actually my body's ready to go on a day when I would probably normally have thought I'm really tired I'm just gonna have a rest day uh, and then sometimes I found the converse where I feel relatively mentally full of beans and want to get going. And the HRV app said, actually, you're really tired. Yeah. And I've had to rein myself back in. And the advice we train with from the HRV app isn't just if you're tired, just take the day off. Obviously, there's guidance to reduce the intensity, reduce FTP, reduce run pace, things like that. So I find that's been good that when I have felt very tired or the HRV's told me to back off, it's not just meant missing sessions. It's meant just adapting what I do. That's been really useful. Yeah, I, you know, I found exactly the same thing. It's sometimes it's like an extra. It's like someone looking over your shoulder and kind of going either, no, come on, pull on your big girl pants and, and get training. Or more than likely, what actually happens is you talk yourself into, I'm, I can do this, I can do this, I really want to do this. And the HRV guidance actually says, Mm-mm, no, let's let's just back off a little bit today. And I found exactly the same as you that that's been the most valuable thing. It's it's often not a kick in the pants when you're feeling tired. It's being told to hold back when, you know, basically when you're, you, you're not ready to take the intense training on. And yeah, I think that has a... Oops, sorry. <laughs> no, it's all right. I was just going to say it's, it's got that kind of you don't know what you don't know effect. And you can feel, I sometimes feel a bit like, ah, oh, I'm kind of wimping out here because I feel like I could do this. But then you don't see the knock on effect over a few days or the next week and that maybe if you had trained, you'd have ended up in a hole. But because you didn't, you don't do and you're ready to keep on going. Yeah. And I think there's been times when had I just gone on looking at the previous few days sessions, I would have thought, well, I should be ready to go. I should be fine. But actually, in the interim, I've worked a 37 and a half hour weekend at work where I've been on the go constantly. And whilst I've only done... 30 or 45 minute runs that have been quite easy the actual physical stress has been much bigger than that so whilst I feel I should be ready to go actually the HRV app says no you're more tired than you think yeah so that's been really helpful during this time I think that's yeah. something I'm definitely going to take forwards I think we, we all need to remember don't we that stress is stress whether it's training stress or work stress or life stress or emotional stress it all has this effect on our sympathetic parasympathetic system that means we can be either receptive or not to training load. And it's tempting to kind of bully yourself into doing stuff all the time. And I was a classic for this. I used to just be like, I'll feel better after doing it. Get out there and do it. But actually, who knew? Like, there's a more scientific way. I love the fact that a little little app can tell you whether you're ready to go or not. And just by avoiding killing yourself on the days when you're not ready to go has a really positive effect. Yeah, and I think because I obviously see what hrv and things actually mean in a physiological sense i think it's probably easier for me to buy in because i know what the hrv actually means physiologically i kind of have a bit more faith in it that it's not just a random number plucked from the sky (laughs) it is actually grounded in science and i think that appeals to me as well because you can't argue with the numbers yeah yeah well you can you can ignore them but you end up just in a hole that's the thing yeah nobody needs that right so tell me um i want to hear about the lakesman i want to hear the story of your first long distance triathlon especially given i had a few pals racing that day and um can remember really clearly being out somewhere else with my mum and dad in blackpool actually and thinking well i'm only an hour away from where this race is being in the back garden and just like melting having to go inside so tell us the story of trying to race in 30 odd degree heat yeah, so it was the famous Hot Lakesman, which I wasn't really expecting because I don't particularly like hot weather to race in. So I booked the Lake District wanting cold and perhaps a bit of rain as well, which isn't what I got. Um, How hot I'd did it get that day? 32 degrees it topped out oh, at in the Lake mental. District. That's like over 100, is isn't like it, or something? <laughs> yeah, so not, not quite what I expected when I entered. And I'd had a moderately warm race at the Paris Marathon in the April as a build-up race. Uh, and still run a PB, so I felt reasonably happy with mid-20s, but just hadn't ever raced in that heat before. Um, In the race week itself, during the taper, I was just watching the temperatures climb on the forecast and starting to get quite worried about how hot it was going to be, but it was too late to do much about it by that point, so tried to stay relaxed, hope to care can get ready for it. Um, 
the day before the race briefing was really good. It's Phil and Marie that run the Lakesman, um, a fantastic race organiser, very athlete centric. Uh, and they made some adaptations to the race, namely lots of extra water supplies uh, and lots of water barrels for us to dunk our heads in on the run route when we overheated. Um, and some relaxation at the less pointy end of the field for being able to get drinks and things off your family members on the run course um, and family members allowed to run with us to support us as well which was nice that's yeah, really smart isn't it yeah really really good stuff from them and um, really impressive from a race organizer to think on their feet like that um, and the race day itself um, it was already hot when I woke up at 5 a.m which was a bit of a concern um, beautifully sunny crystal clear sky but not what you want for your first Ironman and um, I headed down to the swim and kind of got ready for 6 a.m. for the start. And it was already warm in my wetsuit, which was a bit of a worry. Um, Derwent Water itself is a beautiful lake to swim in, so I couldn't have been more lucky. Um, most of the swim went without event for me. I'm not the world's fastest swimmer, but I was very chuffed with how the swim went. There was plenty of space where the temperature was absolutely spot on for someone that gets cold hands and feet. Uh, and other than on the return leg to shore being a bit dazzled by the sun despite tinted goggles it was all really nice and I was out the water in I think just over one hour 20 so I was chuffed with that for a first Ironman swim yeah definitely yeah. Yeah, did the, did uh, the swim go around the island? Did you do two laps yeah, around the around island? The island and, oh, little that's house the magic, middle. isn't it? Just beautiful. Um, really easy sort of swim, really nice water, plenty of room, sort of ideal first Ironman swim, really. Um, so I came out of the water uh, onto the bike, um, obviously expecting a hot one. So I had a bike jersey on loaded up with my snacks, my electrolytes, the, the sort of nutrition plan I'd worked out at the time. Um, I was on a road bike, so at that point, didn't have a TT bike and there are some rolling hills on that bike route but everything was going to plan kind of trucking on at the planned sort of heart rate level and um, there's some rolling hills on the bike route out towards the coast and then there's a beautiful section with a prevailing tailwind up the coast which was really enjoyable uh, does a lot for the average speed as well <laughs> nice you got blown all the way up did you pretty much yeah uh, across towards Solway Firth um was making reasonable time compared to what we thought I might be able to do if all went well. But I was very aware that the temperature was just going up and up and up. And I was starting to feel quite hot. Um, yeah. I was plastered in sunscreen and things, but I did feel like I was burning uh, as a blondie in the sunshine. So that wasn't ideal, but came <laughs> off the bike in just over seven hours, which was a little bit more than we thought. But I thought in terms of damage control in hot weather, probably not terrible. Um. And then that was when I started having a little bit of a meltdown in the heat. Um, I got off the bike uh, to be greeted by one of my friends at the bike dismount, the lady who got me into triathlon and taught me how to swim um, and had a bit of a talking to from her when I was having a bit of a strop. Um, I had a little sit down in transition whilst I put my socks on and had a think about life. And then she came into the tent to promptly throw me back out onto the bike, uh, onto the run course. Um, which is a five lap course uh, with some out and back sections at that point around Keswick itself around the town centre so it's a very spectator friendly run route um, and the first mile or so out of transition is through a park through the trees so I ran through the shade in the trees thinking oh I feel absolutely amazing this is great I don't feel like I've got that bike leg in my legs and then I ran out from under the trees into the sunshine and thought ah oh dear nice just ridiculous at that point was it yeah it was just over 30 degrees um I started making reasonable time on the first lap until I reached there's a section I think affectionately known to Lakesman racers as the highway to hell which is um an a road that's closed off with a couple of out and back sections on it with no shade on it at all so the year I raced it the tarmac was actually melting it was that hot oh, um, wow. haze over the road and the first time I hit that, I just died a bit of a death. Um, I think from then, I just steadily watched the time that I wanted to run for the marathon slowly slip away. Uh, and for me and both my family and the other athletes around, it just became a, a matter of getting it done, I think, in the hot weather. Um, the support at all the food stations and from my family was absolutely superb. Um, my sister and my partner were both there jogging and walking sections with me trying to keep me going despite all the abuse I shouted at them um, so bit by bit we got there um, <laughs> we got it done but it wasn't pretty about halfway round 
I think now with hindsight, I probably had some quite serious sodium issues um, and started to feel awfully sick and could only get plain water down. Nothing else would go down and stay down. So did the whole marathon without really taking any calories or any salt in, which was a bit oh, um, yeah, I knew I did death salt. march. Yeah, it was a bit of a death march. Um, a few of the food stations, I did lick the salt off a few handfuls of crisps, despite not being able to eat them, because <laughs> I knew I needed salt. My doctor brain did kick in at that point. Um, but it wasn't the most pleasant of run courses. But the crowd support was absolutely incredible. Uh, and the support at the food stations. Phil and Marie were also out on the course cheering people on, which I don't think you see that often from race directors. Oh, they're awesome, those two, aren't they? They are just amazing. Uh and as I say, bit by bit, we got there and I got to run down the, the famous red carpet still in daylight, which was quite nice. Um, and I was just overwhelmingly relieved it was over at that point. Um, during the final couple of laps, I very clearly said to my partner, James, that if I ever thought about doing this again, he should probably throw my laptop away and cut up my credit card. Um, um, and within about a week, I wanted to do another um I think the memory of all of the pain and all of the heat was gone and I just wanted to do another uh, and that that was kind of how it came to be as a plan it's funny how that happens isn't it it's funny how you can be utterly convinced during the event that you never want to do this again and then just a week later you can be absolutely convinced you've got to enter the one for next year yeah I think there was a period of coming to terms with not having had the race that I trained for um and beating myself up for how I'd felt in the heat and I think it was only in the couple of years afterwards where we had a, a few heat waves where it hit the low 30s. And at that point was unable to do anything but sit in the garden like a sloth. Yeah. But my partner actually said to me, you know, you did an Iron Man in this. And I thought, yeah, actually. Yeah, maybe it, it, right. it really does bring that home, doesn't it? That when it gets over 30 degrees, I mean, even if it gets over 25 in this country, it's too hot to do anything. And if you're out in direct sunlight, as you are on the, the sort of the highway to hell section of that race where you're going backwards and forwards, there's no shade whatsoever. Iron Man is challenging enough without the environmental factors chirping in as well, isn't it? Mm. Most definitely. Um, I think it took me a couple of years to come to terms with that I hadn't had a rubbish race because of me. I'd had what I didn't think was a good race because of the heat. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think you've got to you've got to add on top of that on races where you're in the heat. An element of riding a bike is you're generating heat at a certain amount of watts. And, and if the sun is also generating that heat stress onto your body, just by common sense, it's got to take away some of your ability to to exercise at that kind of wattage, doesn't it? It's just yeah. got to take it away from you because you just can't shed the heat fast enough. That was certainly how it felt. Um, and I think based on how I felt at the finish line, reflecting on it now with what I've heard from sponsors like Precision Hydration and stuff and what I've learned from obviously my job as well, I think electrolytes played a key sort of part in it. I'd had a lot of electrolytes anyway. Um, but just kind of standard commercial electrolyte drinks, not anything specialist like pH. Yeah. Um, and I think it was a sodium issue. I was wearing a grey tri suit and at the end it was covered in salt. And in my finish line photos, I look really lean and really ripped, but I think I was actually just incredibly dehydrated and looked like a raisin. <laughs> yeah. uh, <laughs> and after the race, I was a bit wobbly. I was a little bit confused and no food would stay down I didn't eat until the following morning so I think it was probably a sodium problem yeah. as well in the heat yeah what what Can't. kind of stuff went through your mind when you were out on the bike because I'm always interested in finding out sort of about people's mental thought processes as they're riding because you know 112 miles is an awfully long way just to do as a day out let alone as a warm-up for a marathon so I'm interested to find out you said you know you had a, a word with yourself and you, your friend who'd been coaching you had a word with you as well what kind of thoughts were going through your head in the back back a couple of hours of that bike ride um I was looking forward to getting off the bike in some ways um I think anyone who's ridden that long in a tri suit would probably be looking forward to getting the bum off a bike saddle yeah. um, so I was looking forward to getting off the bike uh, but at the back of my mind there was just dread about running the marathon in that heat um I think on the bike I had some airflow but I, I could still feel how stiflingly hot it was going to be once I was running rather than riding um 
so there was all the usual concentration. I was thinking about all the timings for fuel and things like that. I'd got a little plan written on a piece of paper stuck to my top tube about where I needed to eat and what, how much I needed to be drinking. Um, so I was concentrating on all of that, but there was just an underlying dread about the run. In that yeah. yeah, yeah, totally understandable. It's, um, it's, it's a real shame, I always think, when environmental conditions, whether it's either too hot or it's horribly cold and rainy, you know, people put so much time and effort into the training for these events. And it all comes down to essentially stuff that's out of your control on race day. How did you, um, you mentioned before that it took you something sort of, sort of like took you time to come to terms with the fact you hadn't had the race you felt you wanted or deserved. What was your process like for going through that? Um, a few days after the race when I'd eaten everything in sight and slept lots and <laughs> eaten all of the salty things, um, I had a Skype call with my coach um, and we went through what we'd planned and how it actually went in reality and where the gap happened. Um, And I think he helped put things in context for me a bit that it wasn't me being soft. It really was horrible conditions. Um, It wasn't a little bit warm. It was baking hot. Yeah. Uh, He was good at putting things in a bit of a wider context for me, which I think was really helpful. Um, And then the other thing was just, talking to my friends who were sporty as well um and I think the more of them that said oh my god we can't believe you did anything in that heat let alone an Ironman the more people said that the more I think I started to reflect and think actually you know I don't think I'm a hero for doing it at all but the more I kind of thought actually yeah that was tough because of the weather so I think it it just took a bit of time to adjust that I hadn't been soft it was just a tough race yeah well speaking of things that are tough for you Working as an ICU doctor over the past sort of 16, 18 weeks with the COVID pandemic going on, it must be incredibly difficult to get to the end of the day. Like I can't imagine, I'm the kind of person who um, sort of rethinks things over and over and over again. How do you get to the end of a day of a shift dealing with really sick patients in your setting and kind of press reset and be ready to go the next day? Is there, a, is there some kind of secret to this that we can learn? <laughs> it's a tough one it takes a lot of practice um I think my poor partner would have tested the first couple of years of being a doctor I was very bad at leaving things in the hospital um yeah. take a lot of things home with me I'd ruminate on them and think about them and go over and over what my part in the management of patients had been and whether I'd done the right thing um and I, I'd worry that I'd missed things and that maybe I hadn't handed over right to the next colleague and that something would get missed uh, to the extent that sometimes I would wake up in a cold sweat in the middle of the night and I would phone the ward in the hospital to speak to the doctor currently on shift and just check that the thing I was thinking about during the night hadn't been missed and that right, okay. I hadn't missed something. So I was very, very bad for the first couple of years for taking things home with me. And then I think over time, I think you, you kind of learn to put things in a box which isn't always the healthiest way to deal with things I think um but you do you gain a bit of ability to detach yourself that's one of the first things that happens that okay you you start to see the case less in terms of emotions and the person's background and their family and all of the things that could make you emotional and you I think the adrenaline kicks in and in that moment you're there as a professional with a set of skills uh, and it's your job to be calm and decisive and just use your skills to do what you're trained for and I think sometimes a bit of autopilot takes over that you you just jump into the role that you have to when the adrenaline hits um I see I think I've got better over time at seeking a little bit of debrief with my colleagues both my consultant colleagues um other juniors like me that have been involved and with the nursing colleagues and I think sometimes just voicing those feelings out loud of wow that was tough or that was rubbish or that was really difficult that kind of thing helps yeah Um, and I think we are getting better in the NHS but it's still a culture that's developing of having proper debriefs after difficult situations where um, both a kind of technical debrief where we look at what happened and what we could do better next time and what we did well um, but also a, a sort of emotional debrief about the feelings we've had just to acknowledge that we work in very difficult situations So there's all of those kind of technical aspects at work and learning to leave the job at the door. 
Uh, and then the other thing I've found helpful has been my outdoor time. That's when I'm running or riding my bike or sometimes swimming, although I have to concentrate quite a lot to swim. Um, <laughs> I'm not a natural swimmer. Um, I find that time outdoors, um, and it's if it's been a particularly tough shift with no headphones and no music or podcasts or anything, that's almost my thinking time. I think the hospital is very noisy and very busy, particularly intensive care, because everything mm constantly and I think just having that silence just to think and to absorb things and process things is quite helpful um and I think that's my the coping mechanism I try to go to when it's difficult because I am aware that in medicine as a whole but particularly anesthetics and intensive care there can be some quite unhealthy coping mechanisms developed um problems with stress and burnout and mental health difficulties are sadly very common in my profession, particularly in intensive care. Um, and it sadly has to be acknowledged that anaesthetists out of all doctors have the highest completed suicide rate. Oh, is that right? Uh, yeah, it's it's a known problem. Um, I don't know whether it's knowledge and means, because obviously we have knowledge of how to do it effectively um, and access to drugs that can effectively do it. Uh, but it is a problem in the profession, as are the usual things in a lot of pressured jobs of, you know, drug abuse, alcohol abuse, that kind of thing. So for me, part of it was about trying to put in place some healthy coping mechanisms so that the knee jerk reaction to such a difficult day wasn't coming home and burying my head in a bottle of wine or another right. behavior. Yeah that it was just to stop and think and do something that was good for me that would release a few endorphins but would also just make me pause um and I find the first few months of being a doctor I, I did probably drink quite an unhealthy amount but I find now over time I've that's gone um and the knee-jerk reaction is no longer god that was stressful I'm going to come home and have a drink um the reaction is now I'd quite like a glass of wine don't get me wrong but I'll go for a run first. I'll try and process things. <laughs> yeah. And if I still want it when I get back, obviously I'll have it. But often the desire then has just gone. Um, and I think it's just for me about using exercise as a healthy way to process things. Yeah, that yeah. I was going to say, do you find that your exercise and your training is, is a way that can either help you process the things you've been through or even just be used as a way to... Uh, help you feel better about a difficult situation in a way that kind of reframes it in your mind yeah definitely um there will always be difficult cases and difficult patients who do stay with you forever um there are certain beds now in our intensive care unit that I can't look at without remembering certain patients who either were incredibly sick there or died there or who I had to call their relatives and tell them they died um so there are there are things you carry with you forever and all of them do shape the doctor that you turn into. But I do find just having that time by myself just to process things is, is quite a healthy way for me. And then I find I can come yeah. home and unwind properly and spend time with my partner. I think also having a partner who isn't the doctor is very helpful. <laughs> I'm sure. to off. And talking about work at home doesn't become a post-mortem of things I could have done differently, which yeah. I think can happen when two doctors are married. I'm sure, yeah. So that's helpful as well because he's very good at helping me to reflect on things. He's an accountant and he's very analytical. And if I find something difficult, he's very good at saying, but you did everything that was correct that you could have done and the rest of it is outside your control and you have to let that go. Yeah, yeah, good so listen to wrap this up what does the rest of well what does the rest of your season this year look like all things willing and where to, where you headed to next in terms of racing and things like that yeah obviously the rest of 2020 is a bit of a gamble at the moment in terms of racing um <laughs> isn't it I just found, yeah i found myself at the end of the well, not the end of lockdown but as the restrictions have been eased um my lockdown training has gone quite well and I'm quite fit at the moment apart from swim fit because I haven't been in the water since March um so I have now got Outlaw X entered at the end of the season nice uh, quite a few teammates entered so I was talked into entering that so if I can manage to get myself back in the water such that I won't drown on race day I'm going to have a go at that <laughs> um and then next year I've decided to get back on the iron course 
and I was lucky enough to get hold of an entry to Challenge Roth next year. Oh, sweet. Um, that's always been on my bucket list, mainly since reading Chrissy Wellington's autobiography. Um, that's been on my bucket list, preferably before I turn 30 and I turn 29 next year. So it's probably the time. Good for you. Uh, so Challenge Roth and I think I'll be going back to the Lakesman in June, all being well. Um, I love that race. And I'm always keen to support it. Um, I've been there, I think, every year since the race began now in one guise or another, either racing or marshalling. So keen to get back there. And then other than that, we'll have to see how the, the next year pans out, what opens up all over the world and what we're able to do. Yeah, fingers crossed, right? Well, listen, thank you so much for your time. It's been really good to hear your story. Um I really hope that the world opens back up again next year and you get to go and do those races that you really want to do so much. But thanks for joining us and sharing your story with us, Sarah. No, thank you for having me. All right, team, I hope you enjoyed that one. Sarah's story is it's a good one, I think. It's a real great example of people using exercise to really help not exactly control the stress that's in their lives, but certainly to deal with it in a positive way. Um, she's doing an incredibly important job. She's doing an incredibly stressful job. I don't know how I would go about managing to keep a lid on the stress of my life if I was doing something like that, but um, Sarah seems like she's doing a fantastic job of balancing both work and training and getting it all done and just look forward to watching a smash it at Challenge Roth next year. Well, listen, I hope you really enjoyed this special edition, the Age Group Stories from the Oxygen United Triathlon Podcast. Here's some discount codes and deals for you to finish with precisionhydration.com you can use the code oxygenaddict15 for 15% off your first electrolyte order you can use the code oxygenaddict20 for 20% off high performance sun protection for athletes at pelotan.cc and if you've liked what you've heard in terms of how Sarah's managed to balance her training and work-life balance you're interested to find out more come and check out our training over at teamoxygenetic.com there's a link in the show notes you can click to book a call with me or the team and just have a chat through how training and coaching might work for you and so remember there's links to all of those in the show notes so you don't have to remember them until next week have a great safe training and racing week i'm coach rob wilby and you've been listening to the oxygenetic triathlon podcast see ya 